Good morning. Happy Father's Day to everyone. It's time to begin our Bible class. I learned a little information this morning about two of our folks I want to share with you. Uh, one, I heard that Erica Thomas was not feeling well this morning, and uh, Jim and Sharon are going over to get the kids and uh, bring them on to church. But uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Erica and try to keep you informed. We know she is close to her due date, and uh, of course you know the circumstances there with baby Ollie. They'll probably have to do some surgery as soon as he's born, so we are praying for Erica and that family. And then uh, it's good to see Johnny back. She's feeling a little better as she's recovering from her, her back surgery. And I talked with Bill and Johnny about Cody, uh, Lindsay's husband. And uh, he's still in the hospital at UAB. He's receiving treatments for the blood clots that uh, he's had. He's been in very serious condition with sepsis and been hit, hit with all kinds of antibiotics. So we're still very concerned about Cody and praying for him fervently that he'll be able to recover and come home very soon. Also praying for Lindsay as she is, is there by his side. So uh, there are, of course, a lot of others to keep in mind, and you can find that on the prayer list, and Tim will give a more thorough prayer list during the worship hour. Uh, but as we begin Bible class, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here today, thankful to be in your presence. On this Lord's Day, when we commemorate the resurrection of your son Jesus and gather around the, the table to think and dwell upon his death for us, we know that without him we'd have no hope. Father, we pray for those who are sick. We're especially mindful of Erica this morning and also Cody and their families. We pray that you build them up. We pray that you heal them and give them strength. And uh, Father, be with, uh, be with them so that they can get back to their, their normal lives and uh, be with the people they love and do the things that they love to do. Father, we're thankful for your word, and we're challenged by it every day. Open our hearts to receive what has been written, what has been revealed by inspiration. Let us have faith in you so that we may walk in your light and live by your ways. Father, we thank you for this church. We pray that you bless the work of our hands. Forgive us when we do wrong, set us on straight paths and give us wisdom to follow you and to bring light into this community and into the world at large. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. We're closing in here to the end of our study of peacemakers. By my account, we have this week and next week, and then we'll be wrapping things up. Uh, we have taken this, of course, in three parts, beginning with world peace and then talking about inner peace. And building on that, we've been discussing the subject of peace between one another. You might think of it as horizontal peace. Inner peace is more about vertical peace between you and God. This peace is a horizontal peace between ourselves. And uh, we have been getting most of our ideas along this line from the Sermon on the Mount. You can see this is part three of that discussion. And we've just been working our way through mostly chapter five, or really just chapter five so far, as we've picked up all of the kingdom ethics related to peacemaking, which begins in the Beatitudes, of course. Matthew 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And then... Last week and the week before, we talked about those uh, antithetical statements in chapter 5. Jesus would say, you have heard that it has been said, but I say to you. And he does that six times, but three of those have to do with peacemaking. Uh, there is the section on anger, verses 21 through 26. 
There's the section on retaliation, or really we should say non-retaliation, uh, verses 38 through 42. And we're going to talk about the third and final one at the end of the chapter, Matthew 5, 43 through 48, loving your enemies. If you're going to be a peacemaker, you have to learn to love your enemies and treat them with grace. So it begins, if you want to look at this section in verse 42 of, I'm sorry, verse 43 of chapter 5, it begins like this. Jesus starts with the tradition. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now this is a case where he's not quoting Old Testament scripture. Old Testament scripture did say love your neighbor, but it doesn't say you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. What was the original that had been corrupted by Jesus' day? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say, and I believe this is Leviticus 18, 15, it doesn't say love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They had done two things. They had narrowed the meaning of neighbor to just people like you. And Jesus, of course, blew that out of the water with the parable of the Good Samaritan when he showed that a neighbor is anyone. Uh, the Samaritan saw a man in need. The man was not like him. He was ethnically different, religiously different perhaps. And he stopped and he did everything he could to take care of that man. Jesus said, that's an illustration of love your neighbor as yourself. And then they had, they had loosened the meaning of love by omitting as yourself. So love did not mean going to the lengths that you would go for yourself, but something a lot more limited than that. So they had, lo they had loosened the meaning of love by taking away as yourself and it tightened the meaning of neighbor by excluding enemies and whoever else they didn't want to love. So Jesus corrects things here as he has in the other places by setting them straight with this teaching. And here's what he says. Let's read verses 44 and following. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. As we look at this, I think the first question that would be helpful is to ask, who are our enemies? Who is my enemy? What is included here by the, the term enemy? And uh, we can start very broadly and talk about political enemies. I think a lot of times when we think of our enemies, we think of our enemies as Americans or as citizens. Uh, we think in political terms. Maybe you define an enemy as some national threat, the Russians or the Chinese, whoever the news reporters tell you is your enemy. Or politically, you may think, on one side of the aisle of critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, LGBT. On the other side, you might think of the pro-life movement. People think of things politically and they put themselves on one side of the aisle or the other and they choose their enemies. Now the thing about this is you can say very easily, I love Russians, I just don't approve of what they're doing in Ukraine. I love the people who march in Black Lives Matter. I just don't approve of the violence in the protests and the destruction of personal property. You know, I love the pro-choice people. I just don't approve of abortion. You can say those things, and because we usually gather together in groups like ourselves, we never come face to face with these people. Are very very rarely do we do that. 
And so they're faceless and they're nameless and they're very easy to quote unquote love. We never actually do anything for them or help them out in a situation. We're never tested on that kind of love. So it's very easy to say, I love my political enemies because we're rarely called to act on that aside from maybe going to the ballot box and casting a vote in private. However, it gets, it gets harder as we go down the list. Think about ideological enemies. You know, for us, that would be atheists, maybe, or evolutionary bi biologists, or the pro-choice movement. People who are moved by idealism that is very different from the ideals of Scripture. This is very similar to political enemies because, again, birds of a feather flock together, and uh, we don't, for example, have ideological enemies within this room right now. Probably not. It's very unlikely. And in these situations, people usually know how to behave themselves, and they'll see that there's order here. This is a class. I'll keep my mouth shut, or I might raise an objection, but I'll do so calmly. And we learn to play nice with our ideological enemies. Usually they are faceless or nameless or they are represented by some celebrity we'll never come into contact with. So again, we're never tested really on loving those enemies. Going down the list, you come to moral enemies. Now these moral enemies are people we're more likely to rub shoulders with. Maybe it's somebody who's living an openly gay lifestyle that you work with or that you went to high school with. Maybe it's a neighbor in that lifestyle. Maybe it's a, a couple next door who are cohabitating. They're not married, but they're living together. Uh, maybe you're called upon to travel for work and have meetings outside the office place and your coworkers are drinking and you have to make a stand and they put you in an uncomfortable situation and you're tempted to be angry, you're tempted to hate them for that. That is a little bit more of a test that we're familiar with when we're called upon to love our enemies. Going on down the list, you can think of religious enemies, um, denominational differences, doctrinal differences. Do we love these people with whom we dif differ on religious matters, or do we hate them or avoid them? It's more of a test because we live in a world where we're used to these kinds of differences, and we're asked in community to interact with these kinds of people. And uh, we'll say things like, uh, I meant to say this with regard to moral enemies, a lot of times we have the saying, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. And uh, with regard to those we have religious differences with, we'll call them our religious neighbors or our religious friends. And so we've learned to play nice with them. And uh, many times it's not much of a test these days. Then we get into those with whom we have differences of opinion. And it gets more real because these are folks who are in our family. These are folks who are friends with us. These are folks in our churches. And there's a great deal in the New Testament about how disagreements over opinion can do great harm to churches. You can look at the example of the church at Corinth and see how they were divided over a number of opinions, one of those being eating meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, some people said, you know, you're not, you can't do that. You can't eat meat sacrificed to idols because in doing so you're practicing idolatry and you're benefiting the idol worshipers. And Paul said, my personal opinion, 1 Corinthians 8, 4, is that an idol has no real existence. So if I'm eating a piece of meat, it can't really be connected to something that doesn't exist. That's a mature opinion of a person strong in faith. But he said at the end of that chapter that if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I will not eat meat. He, he would become a vegetarian for the sake of unity in the kingdom of God. Now that's an example that we find very hard to follow. When we have a different opinion, many times we want to enforce that until everything burns down around us. You know, we just 
really want to win our way in those battles. Paul in Romans also talked about this at length because evidently the church at Rome was divided over matters of opinion. You can look at Romans chapters 14 and 15 and he gives some very challenging advice on how to love your enemies of opinion. And what he says to those who are strong, those who have a good understanding of things, he says you have to bear with the weaknesses of the weak. Bear with the failings of the weak. Again, the struggle was over eating meat sacrificed to idols and also the celebration of certain days, uh, maybe holidays and things like that. And it was dividing the church at Rome and Paul was calling for unity. Now, getting even harder here on this list of enemies are your personal enemies. These are people who have wronged you. These are people who have cheated you, lied about you behind your back, have hurt you for no good reason. Uh, these are the people with whom we hold grudges. Um, and God says we must forgive these people and learn to love these people. That's the most challenging kind of enemy, don't you think? Uh, I heard a story about Andrew Jackson one time when he was campaigning for president. And he had to win over some very influential people. And one of the people that he was working to win over was a, a very influential minister who sat down and kind of interviewed him or interrogated him and asked him a few questions. And he asked him, can you forgive all your enemies? And the question was in view of the many feuds and duels and personal conflicts that Andrew Jackson had had throughout his life leading up to the presidency. And Jackson said, my political enemies I can freely forgive, but as for those who abused me when I was serving my country, who criticized me for serving my country, and who slandered my wife, he said, that is a different case. And the minister made it very clear that a Christian does not harbor ill feelings toward his enemies. And after a long pause and a lot of thought, Jackson affirmed that he would try to forgive his enemies. Whether he ever actually did, uh, we don't know for sure. But it was something that was very challenging for him, and we can all understand that, right? It's one thing when somebody across the globe has a different idea than you, or when somebody has a different opinion from you. But what about when somebody actually hurts you? To use one of Jesus' examples, when somebody strikes you on the cheek. Are you able to continue loving that person? And we're never going to really understand the true challenge of this teaching and the challenge of being a peacemaker until we think of our enemies in terms of personal enemies. As long as you keep it ideological and political and it's nameless and it's faceless, it's going to continue to be something that you can check off the list and say, yeah, I can hate the sin and love the sinner and move on. But if you can put a name and a face to that enemy, and all of us have those, think of that person or those people more likely and ask yourself, do I love him or her? As much as I disagree, am I able to love and seek that person's good? And am I working toward making peace or am I bearing a divisive grudge that will send us apart further and further and further? That's when you really see the true challenge of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we all know how this uh, chapter ends in verse 48. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How do we use the word perfect? We usually say, Perfect is flawless, blameless, never making a mistake. Is that what Jesus means here? Complete. That's exactly right. Not perfect as in flawless, which God is flawless, no doubt about it, but Jesus several times already in the sermon has pointed out that we all have sin and we all have flaws. Think about uh, Matthew 5, 6 in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they shall be satisfied. Future. Right now, they don't have righteousness. They hunger and thirst for it. And Jesus promises them they shall one day be satisfied. Or the model prayer in Matthew 6, 9 and following. One of the things he teaches us to pray is, forgive us our debts or our trespasses or our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. He wouldn't teach us to pray that if his expectation and assumption is that we were perfect in the sense of being flawless. He's using the term here as complete, and he's talking about complete love. What is complete love? It's love that you receive and that you return. Love that comes in a cycle. And the cycle of love for us is that love is sourced in God, who is love. It's showered down, down on us by grace. We don't deserve it. We receive it and we reflect it back to heaven as a, an act of gratitude toward God for loving us. That's the idea. John uses the phrase perfect love in 1 John 4, verse 12 and 17 and 18. And that's what he has in mind. Love that cycles from God to us and then from us back up to heaven through our fellow men. And that's the perfection Jesus is talking about. The context is loving your enemies. And so he's talking about being perfect like that. Uh, someone has pointed out that if Jesus originally spoke this sermon in Aramaic, and it was translated into Greek by his disciples, by Matthew in this case, then the word he would have used there would have been a word meaning all-embracing. So you must be all-embracing as your Heavenly Father is all-embracing. An idea of completion there. So I want to talk about the tools that Jesus gives us here to love our enemies. He doesn't leave us without hope. Um, I mean help. He doesn't leave us without help. He gives us a, a toolbox full of all kinds of tools, a variety of them that we can use to love our enemies. Let's go over that list as we see it there. The first one is love. Now, we have to talk about this at length because love entails a lot of things. But in verse 44... He says, love your enemies. And packed into love is all kinds of, of tools for being able to love your enemies. I want to take you over to 1 Corinthians 13, which is an obvious place to go when you're talking about Christian love because it contains the, the inspired definition for love. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, beginning in verse 4. A lot of you know this passage by heart. It's one of the best-known passages of Scripture in the New Testament. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. I could go through every item on that list, but if I did so, I'd miss a lot of the other tools. So let's just focus on the last four there in verse 7. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. These are tools for loving your enemies. What does it mean to bear with others? It means putting up with their imperfections. Putting up with the things that frustrate you, their annoyances, their sins, their behavior that uh, is unfair, their overly scrupulous expectations, their struggles, personality quirks. This is taught throughout Scripture. Go over to Romans 15.1. I alluded to Romans 15 a minute ago. The church there in Rome was divided over matters of meat, food, over things like uh, esteeming one day over another. And what does Paul say in Romans 15 verse 1? We who are strong have an obligation, that's a, a duty, a mandate, not a choice, an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please 
ourselves. It's bigger than you. It's not all about you. So bear with it. Bear with it. God desires unity. Uh, and again, I brought up the example of 1 Corinthians 8 where Paul said, if, if I need to become a vegetarian so that we can focus on the gospel instead of constantly talking about food, by all means, I'll become a vegetarian. That's a pretty big sacrifice, right? And so bearing with others, another word for that is forbearance. It's one of the tools that love gives you. Secondly, it says, bears all things, believes all things. What does it mean to believe in others? What it means is choosing to believe the best in somebody until proven otherwise. Not making snap judgments. Not being hypercritical. Just waiting on somebody to fail. Waiting on somebody to make a mistake. Not judging other people's motives. Considering the other person's point of view. Asking yourself, is this a matter of faith or a matter of opinion? Not being afraid of people accusing you of just being naive and weak. That's what it means to believe. Believe the best in others until proven otherwise. It's not about being naive. But at the beginning, we don't, when we see something that looks funny or doesn't look right, that doesn't automatically mean that we're correct in our assumptions. Not making assumptions, but getting to the root, communicating and understanding. Thirdly, love hopes all things. That means hoping for the best in others. Looking at their potential instead of their actuality. Now that may mean confronting their sin and going and holding them accountable in a loving way. But you treat them the way Jesus treated his disciples. Do you remember Jesus' first meeting with Peter in John chapter 1, verse 42? He said, Simon, son of John, I say to you that you are Cephas. He gives him a name, Cephas, which in Greek is Peter, and it means rock. Now, Peter was not a rock when Jesus met him, and he proved that many, many times over throughout the gospel accounts. Peter was no rock, but Jesus was saying, the rock is your potential. You will one day become a stabilizing force for good. Turn over to Luke chapter 22. This is on the evening of Jesus' arrest. Peter's still struggling to become that rock. And he's about to make the biggest mistake of his life. Luke 22 verse 31, Jesus predicts his denials. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail... And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is saying in when you have turned again that Peter is going to fall. He's going to fall hard and he's going to need to repent. And Jesus is saying, I love you. I'm hoping in you. I believe there is something better for you around the corner. That the best is yet to be. There's more to you than we have seen yet. And you will turn again, and you will be the one who is able to strengthen others. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Endures through the hard times with others. Putting up with the foolishness and frustration for the sake of love. You're seeking their good, not your own. You're thinking about the body of Christ above yourself. Uh, Philippians 2, 3 and 4, do nothing through rivalry or conceit, but in humility esteem others more important than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, but look also to the interests of others. I believe that's entailed in enduring all things. You, you live with others. You have to do that in a family to keep it together, right? You have to do that in a church to stay together. Friendships go through the need for endurance. And where there's no endurance, the friendship soon ends. Because there are differences and there are wrongs suffered. And our friends 
quickly can become our enemies. So the first tool is, is multifaceted, really. It's like one of those Swiss army knives. Love has all kinds of, of tools packed into it. And we just talked about four of them, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Uh, let's go to the next one. Next tool is prayer. So getting back to Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies, he says. And then he says, pray for those who persecute you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Christian who did not believe in the cause of the Nazis. And he fought from within the Nazi agenda and was eventually killed for it. Uh, he died a, a horrible death. But he called intercession on behalf of enemies the supreme command. He said, there's no greater expression of love than loving your enemies. And as I, I said, he proved that. Loving your enemies is is an expression of love. And one of the best ways to do that is to pray for them. Have you ever tried this? There's very practical benefit for that. It's hard to hate somebody that you're praying for. It's hard to pray for somebody that you hate. And sometimes the best way to overcome emotions and attitudes is to force yourself to act as if you feel the way you're supposed to feel, and eventually the feelings will follow suit. And prayer is a great way to do that. You're supposed to pray for your enemies. So think about someone. I want to challenge you to do this today. Think about somebody who has really hurt you, wronged you, maybe just somebody who is obnoxious and annoys you, uh, somebody who has a weakness that offends you, and pray for that person. I'm not saying condone that person's behavior, Pray that God will get through to this person. Pray that God will give him strength. Pray that he will live long enough to repent and turn, turn away from it. Pray for your own attitude that you can find some way to encourage that person. And see what that does to your heart. Don't just do it one time. Do it over and over and over again. And you'll see it's really hard to hate somebody that you're praying for. Prayer is powerful. Third item on the list are deeds. Now, this takes us to a parallel account. I want to take you over to Luke chapter 6. Jesus talks about loving enemies in Luke 6 as well. Notice how he frames it here. Verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. This is kind of like prayer. It's hard to hate somebody you're doing good things for. It reminds us of a passage we looked at before in Romans 12, 20 and 21, where he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Doing good for others, finding a need they have, and meeting it. Now, it's very important when you're trying to show love in this way and impact a person for Christ that you look for felt needs. Do you know what a felt need is? There are needs, and then there are felt needs. And both are needs. I'm not talking about, you know, desire versus needs or wants versus needs. Both are needs. But people have, usually a person's greatest needs uh, are not the ones they're feeling at the moment. Salvation, for example. A lot of sinners are so far down that road or so uh, deceived, so confused and misunderstood that they don't really feel the need to be saved at the moment. But maybe they're hungry. Maybe... They're behind on their utility bills. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe they could use an encouraging word. Maybe the grass needs mowing. And so you start with the felt need, and that's the light that you shine of Christ that gets their attention so that you can talk to them about their greatest needs 
and they can start to feel those as well. That's what our young people are doing in Gina right now. Um, Gina, Louisiana, this is the mission trip. Uh, I think it's the third time they've gone. And uh, they left yesterday, and there's a lot of work they're doing over there. During the day, they're knocking doors, inviting people to the Vacation Bible School. Uh, they're mowing grass. They're doing repairs. They're cleaning away brush. And they're doing this in a very hot time of the year. But the way they do it is they drive around with lawnmowers, weed eaters, pruners, and they go to houses that look like they need some help. Knock on the door. Would you like us to mow your grass? And you know what most people say? Yes, please. I need that. See, that's a felt need. Is that their greatest need? No, their greatest need is Jesus. But they start with a felt need and then tell them about the church. There's a very good church down there in Gina that works very hard to follow up on all the contacts we make when we're down there. And so this is loving enemies, loving those that are different from us, uh, acts of kindness. In the words of Dostoevsky, love in action is much more terrible than love in dreams. He's using the word terrible there in the sense of striking, attention-getting. Uh, you can think about love and have fond feelings all day long, but it's nothing like actually putting your love into action. Jesus is the best example. You are familiar with Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. He took action in going to the cross for us. But on the way to the cross, he met a lot of felt needs, right? He healed the sick. He encouraged the weak-hearted. He did good. Uh, Peter said in Acts 10.38 that he went about doing good. So deeds, that's another powerful tool for loving your enemies. And then there are the words. I'm still in Luke 6. Uh, we go on to the next verse, verse 28. Bless those who curse you. What does it mean to bless somebody? To bless them is to pronounce them as good. And again, this isn't about condoning sinful behavior. But you can pronounce someone as good no matter how far down they've gone. Because at the very least, they've been made in the image of God and their life is worth something. Some people just need to hear that they're of some value to society, to their family, to you. They need that blessing. They need kind words. So when people strike, we resist with love. Words are powerful. That old rhyme, Stick and, sticks and stones may hurt my bone, break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. And we know that a lot of times we'd rather have a broken bone than a hurtful word. Because the bones heal, but the words, they stay with you forever. A lot of you can think back to something a parent said to you a long time ago or a teacher or a so-called friend that is still haunting you today. So be careful with your words and use them to bless. Read James 3 about the power of the tongue. And what he says tongues are for, they're not for cursing. They're for blessing. That's a really powerful tool you can use in loving your enemies. The final one I want to talk about is forgiveness. And uh, we go forward in the Sermon on the Mount to Matthew 6, 14 and 15 here after Jesus teaches the model prayer. And as I said, part of the model prayer is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So he teaches forgiveness as a conditional thing. Your forgiveness is conditioned upon whether you forgive others. And so verses 14 and 15 say... If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Every command to forgive, think about this, every command of, to, to forgive is a command to take action upon an enemy. You do not forgive people who have done nothing against you. You forgive enemies. 
That's why receiving forgiveness is sometimes very difficult for people. You're going to forgive me? I should be forgiving you. You know how that goes. Because when you forgive somebody, it's implied that they did something wrong to you. And so every command for forgiveness is about loving your enemy. And forgiveness takes a long time. I think one of the mistakes we often make with forgiveness is we think of it as a one-time act. And forgiveness is not a one-time act. It's a process, sometimes a daily process. Look at Luke 17, 3 and 4. This has always been an interesting text for me. Pay attention, Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, when I first started looking at that in detail, like you, I thought of this really bad person and very creative person who could come up with seven sins a day to commit against somebody. But if you step back and you think about it, nobody is really that creative or has that much time in their day to sin against one person, same person, seven different ways every day. But one thing that is very realistic is that somebody hurts you badly and then you try to forgive them and you're okay for a little while, but you wake up the next morning and that old sin has returned and the wound is there just as strong as it was before requiring you to forgive again. Now that kind of thing could return seven times plus a day for many of us. And we have to practice forgiveness over and over and over again. My point is, it's not a one-time action. Forgiveness is a process. And there's a lot to do with that regard. There's much in this instruction about returns. The enemy seems to get a lot out of this. What do we get out of it? What we get is we get to be like our father. Whenever we love our enemies, we're like our father. I didn't get this into the PowerPoint, but look at uh, Matthew 5, what he says next in verses 45 and following. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Remember what he said in the Beatitudes when he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And he's not talking about conversion or becoming a child of God through the gospel here. What he's saying is when you're a peacemaker, you're acting like your father who, who is in heaven because he is a peacemaker. He's coming full circle back to that idea. Love your enemies because God loves his enemies. He goes on to explain, For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? The word more there is an interesting word that means extraordinary, unusual, uncommon. And Jesus is asking us here to be different. He's saying, what extraordinary thing are you doing that cannot be seen in the world today? If you want to be extraordinary in this world, love your enemies. That's something the world just doesn't do. That doesn't come naturally to us. It's a very challenging thing. All right, that finishes what we're going to talk about regarding peacemaking and the Sermon on the Mount. As I said, we have one more class on this, and uh, we'll get into that next week and finish this up. I appreciate your attention.